おいおい上に上がれ関係ねえ<笑> Shall we begin? The answer is coming I can do this all day Tear down this wall いくぞ Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ikuzo Unscripted, powered by Jägermeister. In today's episodes, we have、uh, a very special guest.、Uh, she's a writer, a hiker, a dog lover, also, from what I've been able to see from social media, a passionate natural,、uh, major lover of nature.、Uh, you better know her, obviously, as the author of、uh, Winter Night Trilogy and、uh, the Small Spaces series,、uh, Miss Catherine Arden. Uh, are you ready to go genuine, uncensored, and unscripted with us today? I am so ready. Thank you for having me on today,、um, on this wonderful Friday. Glad thank, to be thank here. Thank you for being here. Yeah. You, I read in your bio,、uh, you asked yourself questions Who am I? What do I want? What, what am, am I willing to do to get it? So, how did you get the answers for these questions? Who is catching her then? Well, that's a, that's a big question to start out with.、Um, <laughs> wow, all right, da, not, not waiting.、Um, I think everyone who's in their early 20s, which I was when I started writing,、um, is asking themselves those questions.、Um, and I feel like sometimes you don't so much as learn the answer as the answer happens to you, if that makes sense. And in my case, I did not go into My 20s, sort of after university, with plans to become a novelist. I had I had specialized in languages.、Um, I was hoping to be an interpreter, but I took、um, took some time after after uni to、um, work on a farm. To work on a farm in in Hawaii.、Um, I was I was trying to find myself, as so many people do.、Um, and what I started doing was writing a book.、Um, it's funny, I didn't intend the book to be the The means of finding myself. I was just bored.、Um, <laughs> literally, I was just bored.、Um, and I think, I think it's really true that sometimes the most important things in your life happen for less good reasons. Like, not、right. because you had this calling or because you had this massive like, sense of mission. Sometimes, not always. And in my case, it was a bit of an accident. I was bored. I started writing a novel.、Um, I loved books. I loved to read growing up. Um, and I discovered that I enjoyed writing books. I enjoyed telling stories. And I decided to at least attempt to finish the one I'd started.、Um, and it's funny because my biggest advice to writers when they ask me is always finish what you start because finishing is harder than starting. And my case took me three years to finish.、Um, My first novel. I i worked on this farm in Hawaii for the first few months. Then I got a job guiding horse trips, like horse tours. So for a big chunk of time, I was going during the day to guide horse trips. And at night, I was writing my book.、Mm, Not yeah. long. Yeah, it was it was a time.、Um, a lot of I i smelled like horse 24 7. And, <laughs> um, But I, I, I did that for a while. And then I got a job、um, in, in France with this like, French government run teaching program where they hire like, Anglophone young people to t- be teaching assistants in French schools. That for a while, I kept writing the whole time.、Um, long story short, I finished the book、um, and was fortunate enough to find a publisher who wanted to publish three books. By then, I'd kind of envisioned this one book as three. Um, it's funny, you can't put as much plot into one book as you think you can.、Um, that was a discovery I made early on in the writing process.、Um, so I ended up with a contract for three books, and I was like, oh, wow, I can't, I, I, I'm doing this now, I guess.、Um, <laughs> and then I wrote a kids' book kind of in between, which、um, ended up being four kids' books, and that's, that was seven books ago. So I feel like I'm, 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 I'm a writer now. It, it happened to me more than I thought. You found yourself. I think so. I think so. I think like finding yourself is not this thing you wake up to. It's this thing that comes to you over time in little,、yeah. pieces, back, little pieces, bit by bit. Yeah, so inspiration comes from boredom. Message of the day. <laughs> I think that people today should pursue boredom with effort because it's hard to figure out. How to be bored today because there's so many things happening to you. Like when I was when I was 24, I didn't have a smartphone. Like I was I was out in this place with bad signal anyway. So there you get you get bored. You want to read books. 
it's like you you get a notebook you imagine stuff mm-hmm. you just i don't know you, you get bored and, you, and, when, and your imagination rushes in to fill the gap when you're bored but nowadays like if you don't want to be bored you don't have to be because there's there's audiobooks there's there's netflix there's movies there's all these things like in your hand podcasts no offense um <laughs> and between all these things like it's so hard to just be there alone with your thoughts um mm. Yeah. That's why I love I love the woods in part because um it it allows you to kind of really be alone with your thoughts or um I like to garden. I have a big garden and I enjoy gardening for the same reason. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, uh you, you mentioned that uh, how much time it took you uh since you put the word on first word on the paper to the finished product. But tell me this, uh you said that uh, it came to the three books you were you were thinking one maybe two but it came out three books for Winter Night Trilogy. Uh, did yeah. you already, when you started writing, did you already had like ending in your head? Did you already had, oh, this is where the plot is going to go. This is the resolution for these characters. Or were those stuff, you know, as you went, changed and things like that? Um, that's a great question. Um, I knew what I want, where I wanted the books to end. I knew because it was a historical moment that I was kind of aiming for. Um, so I knew that, but the path to get there really, really changed. Um, I always knew where I wanted to go, but I didn't know how to get there. And it took a little bit of trial and error um, and and some wrong, wrong decisions to get to the right ones, to get me to the end. Um, so, so yes, I knew where I wanted to go. No, I didn't know how to get there is my, is my real answer. Yeah. yeah, but have you ever maybe wanted after your work was published? Uh, have you ever wanted to rewrite uh, some parts? Always, always. There's always something I'm not satisfied with. I mean, but the thing is, like, you can't rewrite it. It's done, so it's important to put it out of your mind just for your own sanity. Um, but yeah, there's something <laughs> I would change in every single book. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a scene I would have added, or something that I would have redone, or something that I feel like I couldn't figure out how to fix, but it's not quite quite i can see what the problem is Uh um and like i feel like there's always readers who also notice what i noticed um there's also readers who are like what i don't see that at all so you know you just you gotta let it go i mean if you don't like your work and move on you just you just turn you, you just are crazed right you know yeah, I mean, uh, for the books you can like uh, in the movies, there's a director's cut, so there's a hope for another version. But uh, with books, it should be a little harder. Yeah. I mean, if there's like a specific small mistake, like like a continuity problem or a typo, and somebody notices it, you can ask them to fix it in the next printing. Be like, hey, there's a typo. Do you mind just like making a quick correction? But like, as far as like adding a scene or changing something larger, no, that's never gonna happen. Yeah, or, or you could be like Tolkien and write around 10 versions of the same story. You yes. could write the same thing. I mean, Tolkien was like a legendary perfectionist and yeah. spent, I feel like for him, it was so much a process of like discovering his world as he wrote and wrote and wrote. He wasn't like on a publication schedule of all things, my goodness. So um, very different way of, of approaching his 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 world and his work. What do you think? Could you invent a language? No, no. He was a linguist. He was, he was a trained linguist who specialized in like Nordic languages. Like he based his languages on existing ones. Like he he was brilliant. And I'm ah mm, no. Um, I feel like people who can make up whole languages are on a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, tell me this. Uh, like when you, for example, uh. In, in the Winter Night trilogy, because obviously it's a long series, you know, three books. You know, uh, your time scheduled. Were you pushed maybe by uh, the editing team to? Did you have scheduling conflicts? I mean, uh, were you pushed to maybe finish something faster, uh, or were you on time? Things like that. Ha, no, I was delayed. Um, I was delayed. So I finished the first book, and the publication was scheduled for um, like. January 2016 um and they told me that fall they're gonna push it back 2017 so a whole year um a whole year back um and I guess I can say this now well I don't know 
Yeah, it's been a while. The reason was back at back the time, like five years ago, there was some hope that um, the Winds of Winter, the Game of Thrones book, would come out mm-hmm. that January. They don't want my book to conflict with it because I would have gotten squished like a bug, um, publication wise. But you know, the book didn't come out. Um, and and but the book mine was still scheduled for a year later anyway. So I had an extra year to kind of like put into my my timeline, and so I wrote the second book in that year. So by the time the first book came out, the second book was finished. Um, which put me, which put me fairly ahead of like the game, and so then as I was doing promotion for the first book, I was writing the third book, um, and the third book was about ready to go right as the second book came out, and so I got kind of ahead. I had some built-in time to put me ahead of the game. If I hadn't had that time, I probably would have struggled to make a year, year, year um, deadline for each book. I like to think of myself as quick but i'm actually not that fast unfortunately some people are very fast yeah so writers live in uh, fantasy writers live uh, in a fear from winds of winter every year because we have those news that the winds of winters are coming every now and then how many people (laughs) suffered i don't know i i have no idea i feel like i i don't know i mean if you start thinking about everybody else's publication schedule you're gonna lose your mind um (laughs) But I, I was appreciative at the time. Like I didn't want to get squished like a bug by a much, 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 much bigger author. Um, so that was good. And I'm sure Winds of Winter will come out eventually. And I'm excited to read it when it does. One day. One day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, have it maybe ever happened that you have some parts of the book that you really liked and you wished uh, to come to the final papers, but publisher says no? No, because, well, so there's always scenes where I'm like, well, that was a good scene. But the thing is, the only thing I want is for the entire book to work. Mm-hmm. to really work and if a scene can go it usually means it should um because if a scene is working in the context of the whole novel you feel that it shouldn't go like it needs to be there and so i don't generally have regret cutting scenes because i know they're not part of the the book that i'm after mm-hmm. um so I, I I usually write a lot more than I publish. So I'm not super precious about cutting cutting work. Um, I'm actually pretty quick on a, like writing a scene level. It's more that I'm a bit of a perfectionist myself, and I'll rewrite the same scene many times, or I'll I'll discard a scene and try a new scene or something, which takes forever. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that. Um... Actually, George Martin was speaking, I believe, on some convention with Stephen King. And uh, Stephen King said that his work ethic, obviously, he releases many books and he's legendary for that. He said that he tries to write six pages a day. Uh, what What is it like for you? Can you write? How many pages can you write today? I don't think of it as pages. That's cool that he does. Um, I think of it as word count. So I try to write 2,000 words a day. Um, so I, how many pages is that? Five-ish, I guess. Unclear. Um, well, no, not like four, because 500 words is about your standard Word document page, really, really big. Um, so I guess about four pages, but six is a lot. Wow, that's that's 3,000 words Yeah, but he, he published like 1,000 books, so it's obvious. <laughs> he, he's a whole other level of brilliant, and um, he's also a, very, a writer who loves like long books and like verbose books, like with lots of text. Um, so... Like, the thing about writing is everyone's different. Like, everyone has their own thing going, like, how fast they write, how they write. I like to write by hand a lot of the time. Um, so a lot of my early work on a book is in a notebook. Um, I have whole drafts of things in notebooks. Um, some writers hate pens with a passion. Um, some writers use Word or Scrivener or a freaking typewriter, who knows. Um, it just, it's, it's whatever works for you. Mm. And that's kind There's of There's no cool. formula. There's no formula. Even from book to book, like the approach can change. Mm. Um, so it always feels like you're starting over with each book, which is great and also terrifying. Mm. Um, yeah. do you, do you believe now that we are talking about the process of writing, do you believe in writer's blockade? No, 
I, I don't. So writer's to me, writer's block is not that you have lost the ability to make words. Like you can always make a sentence. Like you can always say like, I don't know, the quick brown fox jumped, right? Um, um, uh, the issue is you is you are trying to make your words good. That's the block is that you feel like your words aren't achieving your expectations. Expectations are, are very dangerous, especially for drafting. Um, because the only job of a book draft is to exist. It doesn't have to be good. It has to be finished. Um, and I think writer's block is when your expectations and your actual writing are in a disconnect. Um, and so what happens is you, instead of just pushing through, you start like rewriting and rewriting and staring at the page and like fussing. And the only cure is to just like sit down and start moving your fingers and if it's terrible, just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, like there's no way out but through. Um, and if you start thinking there is a way out, like it's not through, that you have to like have the right day or the right inspiration or the right muse or your favorite sweatshirt, or I don't even know, like the right weather or the right inspiration, you will get stuck. Um, and so I think, and I'm sure Stephen King would probably agree with us, the only way to be a writer is to write, is to sit down and write and not think too hard about what other people will say when they read it. Because again, expectations are death, um, especially in the early stages when all you're trying to do is transform like very abstract ideas into words. Yeah, those were yeah. some really useful inputs for me because I'm trying to write a little uh, okay. fantasy book and you know I, I'm in a bus and I have this scene in my mind completely whole mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself oh, I have to write this down when I get home but then I open my iPad and nothing yeah I know the feeling like like I just make a sentence you know like even if it's about, even if it's even if it's the worst thing even if like even if like aliens land mid scene and you're like why are these aliens here you just keep going um like that's the only way forward for for so many problems with writing um yeah yeah that is my stock answer uh tell me this uh you know did you like winter night trilogy that i read and i read it fairly recently and i finished it back to back to back uh, mm -hmm. it's very uh, grades are very good you know uh, I got several recommendations on the internet and uh, but were you like when it first came out were you scared maybe of the opinion of the fans were you like I don't care I'm just glad it finished uh, what was your reaction and later to the positive praise uh, what was your mindset I mean, I think I was mostly scared because if the book didn't have an audience, then I wouldn't be able to keep writing them professionally. Um, you know, after like your your publisher is trying to, at the end of the day, like sell books for money so that and then pay you. So my biggest fear was that I just would have it flop and then those three books would be my only books and I would just, you know, go do something else, which would have been fine. But I, that was that was my big fear fear um and of course you want people to like your books like you're human you want people to read them and enjoy them you want to see yourself read you want you know to feel like you accomplish something and so I mean I was definitely nervous I also again expectations are death so I did a lot of like turning off my email turning off social media after Bear Nightingale came out I went I went to Europe and just like couch surfed for months um with only a very vague contact with sort of like stateside things which actually really helped um because i was focusing on the next book i was um just for my mental health trying not to fixate on what was happening with the books in the u.s um and i was obviously glad they did work out um they worked out it was great um i did get the chance to write more which was a good feeling and um and yeah, it, it, it did work out, but there were, there were certainly some nights when I was like stressed about it. Like, wow, what if nobody likes it? Um, I had a particular Russian professor in school that I was a prickly afraid would hate it. And he did actually hate it. That's, that's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> he was like, what is this nonsense? Wow. <laughs> that's okay. But why? Why didn't you like it? Because I, I, I took history and mythology and made a strange Americanized mishmash. Which, okay, but, fair. 
but yeah, I mean, uh, by the way, your is least Americanized version the, 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 of these kind of when you're talking about especially Russian, you know, influence on the pop culture and media in the U.S. Your yours is least like there is definite research that you've done, and that is. And by the way, if it's not obviously, it isn't supposed to be historically correct because it's historical fiction you know so of course of course like there's this argument to make but you're not going to argue with your professor you're just like i'm sorry i did my best and like yeah i i did want i i had i spent two years in moscow as a student back when you still could spend two years in moscow as a student um <laughs> yeah um i i studied russian i read a lot of pushkin like i watched a lot of soviet cartoons um wow uh, so it, it all that kind of did I came at it from that place. Um, I think that may be a similar situation in Russia because Montenegro is also a Slavic country is that uh, we generally have some kind, let's say, dogma between elementary, high school, and even university professors of literature uh, about fantasy novels. You know, I think that 90% of professors skip mandatory Lord of the Rings because it's Tolkien, it's fantasy, and they kind of just discarded yeah i mean most of the professors in montenegro haven't read a book that came out later than Ivo Andrich, uh 20th century beginning like that's the latest they read yeah or read a book by a woman or god forbid read a fantasy novel and the funniest thing is sometimes people will like, uh, like a famous literary author will kind of circle back and do something in the fantasy or science fiction realm and it'll be like oh this groundbreaking work and the entire science fiction community is like yeah it's 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 robots we, we've done we've, 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 we, yeah yeah you know what i mean like there's a disconnect in genre um which i hope i hope is ending a bit i do feel like there's fantastic fantastic work being done um in genre right now and i think it deserves re serious readership like it just does you know there's so many wonderful writers um who deserve to be studied and thought about yeah. and you know parsed whatever so yeah mm. yeah i mean uh, i feel it because I, I love reading uh but i'm also very picky about what i read because i always think uh, uh till the end of my life i will read only 0.0001 percent of the great books that came out actually that i want to read oh, so i'm like yeah picky about the books you should be picky actually I think so i will i'll put a book down if it hasn't gotten me in 50 pages i'll put it down um i there's definitely been books i've kind of pushed myself through where i was like i um didn't work for me and i've i've tried to read more widely like read more books in translation um read more books from sort of lesser known like eras or writers that i think got overlooked um as a writer today, it's hard to balance reading older books versus frontless titles because there's always a, the newest, hottest book coming out that you feel like you should read um, just to be like with it, um, which leaves less time for like older titles that might be amazing, but it's just um, hard to find all the minutes in the day to do everything you want to do. Yeah, it's not easy to, to, to read books. I mean, it's fairly easy to watch a film in my opinion like you know you sit down two hours you know yeah. but some books like you can read them like 100 pages a day but some books even if they're good you're like want to taste them you want to spend time with these characters and things like that i hope i hope as we move forward i feel like people have shorter attention spans than they used to and i i hope that long difficult books are not a casualty of the 21st century um because i feel like long difficult books can be amazing but they don't reward like you know that half an hour or whatever then again audiobooks have become a huge thing and there's so many fantastic books that are great in audio i, I don't know i don't know i think i think probably people said this about the printing press in like 14 whatever when it was invented like this will this will ruin the experience of monks copying books by hand that's the world coming to um so i think we're probably fine i'm gonna yeah yeah probably yeah and have you ever felt like a villain to your protagonist sometimes even unwillingly having to put them through troubles through pain through the, even despair to build their character 
so readers would get more interested in your story. Have you ever felt the pain of your characters? I felt, I mean, I've, I've, when the scene goes right and it's sad, I definitely cried before. Um, I will say completely honestly that I never, like, I, I feel for my characters. I'm never out there being like, oh, they're real humans that I'm really doing real things to. They're people yeah. I invented. Um, and if I get the story right, I usually don't feel bad for the terrible things that happened to them to get there. Um, in part because they are, at the end of the day, people I invented. Um, and often what happens with, with characters is that the plot is what drives and builds their story. Like the, the things the plot needs them to be, whether that's cowardly, brave, intelligent, silly, um, are what creates their personality. So um, I think there's plenty of authors who find the character first and build the plot around it. I feel like I more often build the plot around the character, like the plots first and then the characters grow as they fit into their story. Mm, yeah. So. Let me ask you this, because uh, I, uh, I listened to some authors and uh, some particular authors said something very interesting. Uh, you know, I first, before I want to, start writing a book i think of uh, themes that i want to present and then i find the best story to present those themes with mm, is, is something similar with you or you're like uh, this is a story and let's see what themes can i bring with this story i mean i hats off to folks who can do that i think you tell the story first and the theme if there's one appears as you go um Definitely Stephen King said something similar. He was like, yeah, I write the book, I tell, I tell the person's story, and then if there's a theme, the theme usually sort of like comes to me towards the end. Like when he was writing, I saw an interview one time when he was writing Carrie, his sort of first breakout book back in the 70s. He was writing, writing long, writing long, and didn't realize that one of the big motifs was blood of various kinds. Like like there's the early scene with menstrual blood and then like the pig's blood later um that didn't occur to him until he was done and so he went back through sort of after the fact and like emphasized this sort of like motif throughout um but it wasn't planned um one one nice thing about writing is that once you finish your draft you can go back and make it look like you knew what you were doing oh, yeah. um, when you didn't at the time and i think that's probably true of most writers i i feel like there's probably some some paragons who can always know what they're doing but i certainly can't and i feel like many writers can't or don't but it doesn't matter the process you can trust the process mm, yeah uh, let me ask you this uh winter night trilogy one of the heavy themes i believe especially in the first book is religion and yeah. its relationship with power fear and let me ask you this, did maybe, because you spent some time in uh, Russia, did maybe some uh, real life uh, events in Russia at the time, because in Russia, the Orthodox Church, just like in Montenegro in many ways, uh, is married to the power structure. Uh, did that came from that or was, was it just from your historical uh, background of the book? I mean, I definitely had images of churches in my head, like, um, like Basil the Blessed on Red Square, um, his famous church, or the Church of Spilled Blood in St. Petersburg, or some of the older churches um, in the Yaroslav um, were in my head. I think, I mean, and then I had the image from like very, very long ago with like Vladimir the Wise, um, sort of baptizing the Rus and take, tearing the gods out of the temple and drowning them in the in Dnieper. That's like a, was a, was an image that I had in my head too. Um, but just like thinking of like modern Russia, I, I don't think I was. I think the biggest thing I got from my current time, my time actually in Russia was, I read a lot of Pushkin. Um, I went out to Irkutsk in Siberia one February, which was not a good decision, but it was the cheapest tickets I could find. I was very cheap um, and poor. Um, and it was really cold there in Siberia in February, which, yeah. Um, and I went to this outdoor museum, which had buildings, like sort of medieval 
buildings, like re remakes of like an Isba, like the, the, the little hut um, that a peasant would live in. Um, and I remember going into one and it had this giant stove inside. Um, the stove was bigger than bigger than half the, the entire hut. Like it was huge. Um, and the entire world felt so incredibly cold. Um, it was so, so cold outside, but this one hut was warm, um, because they had the stove going, this massive, massive, massive oven. Um, and the, the old, the old lady who worked there, this, this Babushka, she, um, she spent about 20 minutes lecturing me about my my boots because they were wrong apparently um and i needed to know why they were wrong and that i was going to render myself just dead soon with my wrong boots that was a really long <laughs> so so that whole moment was was one that i had in mind when i was writing um what other moments i feel like as far as the conflict between church like between like orthodoxy and like sort of paganism i feel like that I was thinking of like the the Vladimir, like the wise moment. And I was thinking also of just like um the sort of idea of like dual faith, which I studied in school, like the idea that um that that paganism coexisted with orthodoxy sort of reasonably peaceably for a long time. Um and I asked myself, like, I, I understand the concept of like dual faith. Um, but was it always peaceable, always? in 500 years um and my answer was probably not like i'm sure at some point someone was like this is no um and then i asked myself okay so if it wasn't always peaceable what would a conflict look like and that mm -hmm. um is where i got some of the religious conflicts it also was like this is very silly but i enjoyed when i was a little kid i enjoyed the disney movie the hunchback of notre dame which was a very strange Disney film in retrospect, but it had a dramatic. Many of them are when you look back. Look back, you're like, what's going on? Um, but the the priest, the priest of the cathedral, Frollo, who like has this like really intense song called Hellfire about Esmeralda, um, which again, why is it a kids' movie? I'm not sure. But it, I remember I remember that too. I was like, okay, we're gonna do Frollo um in 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 an Orthodox Frollo. So those are my influences. Like, that was kind of a rambling answer, but it's an interesting question. And I do like thinking back on like because sometimes you don't know what's in your head when you're writing. You're like just writing away, but you look back on it and you're like, oh, I had this, 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 and this in my head. Um that's where this came from. And so do you do you love to keep secrets in your books? Your personal secrets, secrets of people close to you, or secrets in other sense, you want your readers to find out, uh, find out uh, uh, in form of foreshadowing, maybe. I mean, my kids' books have, like, in-jokes between me and people I know. They'll be like, ha, I know where that came from. Um, but it's, and, and I guess in the Winter Night books, there's a lot of, like, extremely low-key references to fairy tales, like sneaky ones, or just references to, like, random things that i find fun putting in that nobody else really notices like um like in the first book the main character boss lisa her sister calls her little frog um that's like a reference to like the fairy tale of boss lisa the wise where she's a frog princess um in the second book there's this big horse race um spoilers and it's the main character boss lisa versus this this guy who turns out to be like my version of cachet the deathless um that's the best scene in your book oh best thank you in, in, I, I, in think all three. I think it's the best scene in probably all three books you're probably right um at one point one point his horse stumbles and like trips which again happens in the fairy tale mario moreno when cachet is like chasing the hero and maria right his horse stumbles and he's like what's happening nag like that whole scene right um so that was a reference just stuff like that where i'm like nobody's gonna notice this stuff because it's just me and me kind of being funny but i enjoyed that there's a chapter in winter of the witch called enemy at the gate which was a soviet film about stalingrad again just like stupid stuff like that like um i don't know there's the in the fourth in the third book there's a mushroom spirit called dick Grib who's a reference to the the, the Soviet film Moroska, where there's like a mushroom guy. If either of you have seen that film, it's on YouTube. Um, so again, it's just, just stuff like that. Um, just, just entertaining myself and like the three people who get every reference. Um, 
but yeah right. the vast majority of readers are not going to see those things and like it's a matter it's just me messing around um so yeah, it'd be dark at, it's getting dark at four right now it's so dark yeah it's already yeah. dark here yeah. But here, here it was dark since the mornings because the rains and storms yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, spirits and uh, <laughs> all the other things. Yeah. At least, it's, at least, at least when it's snowy, it's much brighter because the yeah. snow reflects so much light, so it doesn't get as gloomy. Like I remember, yeah. like London or Paris in November are super gloomy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like if you want, like Saint Petersburg, forget it. Like everyone's just depressed because it gets dark at like noon and it's. Yeah. gray the rest of the time yeah. oh. you feel it's 10 p.m at 4 p.m i mean just when the dark hits and but i love uh waking up to the snow everything is white and, yeah so much it's it's snowing so hard right now like it's it's beautiful mm-hmm. outside but it's uh, for us it's a little bit different because um these soviet uh, former co- communist blocks here they're all gray <laughs> so you wake up to the depression you're <laughs> depressed really? and i feel same for the russians <laughs> yeah. i remember i remember those apartment buildings every door the same every layout the same mm-hmm. yeah. all the, the, all the, the too much furniture like like there's all this like massive amounts of furniture inside like the grandma would keep i don't know just like it's a thing weirdly like, decorated right strange yeah. strange upholstery like weird patterns like hmm, interesting um yeah. i remember i have a lot of, a lot of fun memories Almost. Right I'm most you're sleeping, buddy. <laughs> he's he's sleepy. He has his bed right by the stove, which is right here. Mm. Which is nice place. Cozy. Oh yeah, it's warm. It's nice. Mm. Moose, Moose likes it. He's more of a summer dog, so in the winter he stays pretty close to the fire. Yeah. Um, yeah. He picked his place. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse. Yeah. Um, and he does. He comes like we'll go we'll go skiing together. Like he loves to be outside, but he definitely gets cold, so he has a coat. Mm-hmm. Um, he has little boots and when we come back inside, we, he just like goes straight to his bed by the fire. Oh, buddy. Oh, oh. Anyway, I'll stop boring you with my, with my, my dog. He's <laughs> no. playing my dog. Could be worse. Could be cats. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> there you go. He tries to connect with the, uh, with cats. But... Yeah. <laughs> Cats Nothing. don't love you. Cats, I, people think their cat loves them, but their cat doesn't love you. Your cat no. only wants from you. Like your dog loves you, but your cat does not love you. It you would eat you. But they don't. If, if you were dead, they would eat you. Yeah. Um, but I kind of respect that. It's yeah. the survivor it's instinct. True. It's true. It's true. Cat like cats, cats free, you know, cats like you want to go. That's fine. I'll be here. Mm-hmm. Whereas dogs like, oh, my God, don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I love you so much. And so, 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 <laughs> what do you mean? want in your what do you want in your pet is the question you'd have a goldfish they don't love you either <sighs> they don't think even about you mm. but okay <laughs> people have snakes i remember in mm. college people had snakes um one time a snake got out and they found it wrapped around the hot water pipe in the girl's bathroom there was some screaming it was pretty funny wow yeah, yeah but was... how how many people can say that cat actually jumped in their lap during their trip in the bus because it did uh, into my lap yeah <laughs> that's bragging that's right pretty great that's that's pretty great yeah that's we were in the bus and, and people, people were talking about something and i noticed that something is happening and boom cat in my lap just a cat Out just like oh you're my friend now that's yeah. pretty <laughs> when i was yeah. a student in moscow we found these two kittens and a box and a cardboard box by the side of their own mm-hmm. and um my friend had an apartment so took them there and we spent the next like month like racing away from class every hour to feed them like milk out of a dropper Mm -hmm. um but they they survived they survived there was a gray kitten and an orange kitten and they were named sasha and ira and they grew up and became pet cats and it was great they grow up so very fast (laughs) they do they do i mean we weren't sure for a while though because it was like they were very small their eyes were closed Mm -hmm. they had like they couldn't eat so it was touch and go for the first couple of weeks. But yeah. they live. Get it, kittens. Anyway. So shall yeah. we continue with the interview? Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you know that you are translated into our language? Actually, Serbian, but Montenegrin is same. All those languages he's here, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, all the same. Yeah. I, um, I, so it's funny. I, I did a trip to Croatia in 2019. Mm-hmm. 
where I did some events and I ended up, I ended up in Serbia for a couple of events too. So I did an event in Belgrade. Um, where else was, I don't remember actually where the other events were. It's been a couple of years, but, um, Mm -hmm. I had one, I had one reader drive from Montenegro. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It was, she drove to Belgrade. I was, I was like, I was like that. So what, three, four hours the mission, right? Eight, Um, eight eight hours. Okay. Okay. So she, she did a big drive to, to make the trip. So, um, I love the Serbian covers. Um, I think they're yeah, gorgeous. They especially, I can see them behind me. Yeah. Especially the girl in the tower cover, I think. The one with the circle is absolutely beautiful, and I really like it. Yeah. All here. Yeah. 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 And Amazing. Um, I wish I don't have copies of them. I wish I did. Yeah. You're okay. welcome to come uh, to come and grab a couple of copies. There you <laughs> yeah. go. It's like fly over. I should. I should. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have maybe some ro- role models between writers of fantasy? Because we mentioned Tolkien mm-hmm. earlier, Stephen uh, Stephen King. Any others or yeah, that that you particularly admire? You know, like to read things like that. That's a great question. Um, let's see. When I was growing up, I was a big fan of this writer named Robin McKinley, who wrote fairy tale retellings. Um, like she did a famous um, retelling of Beauty and the Beast, did one of Sleeping Beauty. Um, she was a huge sort of influence, and I was a big fan when I was younger. Um, as an adult, I oh my gosh, what have been my my top my top writers um i really enjoyed madeline miller's work um i've been a big fan of jemison i read there's so many great women in fantasy right now um i really enjoyed Susanna clark um who wrote um jonathan strange and mr norrell this sort of massive massive fantasy work um but i really love historical fiction too i love historical fiction and and non-fiction so i um i'm a big fan of the scottish writer named dorothy dunnett um patrick o'brien um, this slightly older but amazing writer called Mary Renault, um, who wrote, she wrote this amazing historical retelling of the myth of Theseus called The King Must Die, which is one of those books that like is amazing. It was written in the 60s. Um, mm-hmm. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm trying to think what else has been influential. Um, and I just love nonfiction. Like I read a ton of it um, and it often has nothing to do with what I'm writing necessarily mm-hmm. like i um what have i enjoyed recently i read um this one book called Killers of the flower moon by oh. his name david oh yeah it was a story of how of um this series of murders um, like, yeah, yeah yeah it was great right it was great about the about the origin of the fbi in america it was amazing i read this book called prairie fires which is a story of this writer laura ingles wilder who's an american writer um I read um, Midnight in Chernobyl, this English language work about the Chernobyl disaster, um, which HBO based their miniseries on, which was a great miniseries. Um, if you haven't seen it, it was really good. No, well done. Not yet. Um, actually, yeah. I've never seen American series or any capture that late Soviet look as well as they did. Like the mm-hmm. clothes, the lights, like, like you look at it and you're like, oh my God, the 80s. Mm-hmm. in you like like it was it it's really you know some they're they're whoever their they're set person their costume person did a good job mm-hmm. um, yeah well think about it uh, when netflix makes anything in mexico they uh, put the screen on orange then <laughs> so <Yeah>. you know <laughs> don't be surprised so do you think that maybe you will get to see your works on the big screen or tv series there was i don't know where the it is right now but um, um about a year ago and i you know you never know what these things like somebody buys the option and then the option lapses or they renew the option or they do something with it but i think just in general i think winter night would be an amazing animated movie or tv show almost more so than live action Mm, yeah that's Uh, interesting i think it would just be really cool um, I think you could have so much more fun with like the environments, the creatures, the supernatural characters, um, if they were hand drawn or if they were computer generated. Um, I I just feel like that's for me that would be the ideal of how to do the show, do the do the books. But you never know. Yeah. Okay. And I have one more question. Uh, can I send you my manuscript when I finish it? 
<laughs> if I <laughs> finish it. <laughs> yes, you can send your manuscript. I make no promises, but yeah. you can definitely send it. Yeah, of course. And we have a little tradition for the end. We have the quote okay. on Montenegrin language from one of our people and then translated it with English. So I okay. prepared a quote from a writer uh, named Chamil Siric. And quote on our language would be, it's a little bit long. Kada pisac ima dovoljno mašta, može istinu da izmisli. Izmišljena istina je isto što i stvarnost. Čitalac ne osjeća koliko pisac koriguje prošlost, pisac je najzainteresovaniji da upućuje na ljepše, na ono što će biti od koristi u budućnost. Umjetnost, pisana riječ, izmišljena istina. Kako rekao smo, žive mnogo duže od pisca. I zato valja pisati i ovječiti im univerzalnim istinama. Istinita je ljubav i mržnja, smrt i život. Sve one žive u narodu, u čovjeku, u meni i vama. Maybe you notice some similarities to Russian language. When a writer has enough imagination, he can invent the truth. Fictional truth is the same as reality. The reader does not feel how much the writer corrects the past. The writer is most interested in, point, uh, in pointing to the more beautiful, to what will be useful in the future. Art, the written word, invented truth, as we said, live much longer than the writer. And that is why it is uh, necessary to write about eternal universal truths. Love and hate, death and life are true. All of them live in the people, in man, in me, and in you. That's beautiful. But, and I definitely think that's true. Um, yeah. I think the role of writers is to tell us what things mean. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And to invent, yeah, is to, to almost like invent the past by telling yeah. us what to feel about it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being here. Thank, thank you very much. Guys. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful afternoon. Um, yeah, you yeah, as well. Again, thank you. It's nice to meet both of you. We stay genuine, uncensored, and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Because all.